Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Julia Fleury, a staff member supporting a Tobacco Cessation Quality Improvement Project housed at UC Davis. TOPS is organized by C. Shang from Ohio State University, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Catherine McLean from George Mason University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose comments and questions in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter after. and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from George Mason University to introduce our speaker. Today, we kick off our summer fall 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Professor Marcus Mufano entitled, Using Mendelian Randomization to Explore the Gateway Hypothesis. Marcus Mufano is a professor of biological psychology and medical research council investigator at the University of Bristol, where he was recently appointed associate pro vice chancellor for research culture. In 2019, he co-founded the UK Reproducibility Network, UKRN, which now includes local networks at 60 UK institutions and 25 international members. In the last year, a number of other national reproducibility networks have emerged in other countries modeled on UKRN. In 2021, UKRN received funding from Research England to grow and embed open research practices across the higher education sector in the UK. Our discussion today is Dr. Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Murfano, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation to uh, to come speak to you today. And um, I'll start with my uh, disclosure slide, which is that the research that I'm presenting was funded by the UK Medical Research Council, which funds the um, uh, Integrative Epidemiology Unit, of which I'm a part and have a program on health behaviours uh, within. And we've also received uh, research funding um, for related work from Action on Smoking and Health UK. Um, and there are no other relevant disclosures to report in the context of this paper. So I'll be talking about um, a single article and unpacking elements of that. So this is a paper uh, led by a senior postdoctoral researcher within our group, Zoe Reid, and supported by um, another colleague, Robin Wootton, where we used Mendelian randomization, a technique that I'll explore and explain in a moment, to look at the possible causal effects of smoking initiation and alcohol consumption on substance use outcomes, what one might consider a variant of, if you like, what's been described as the gateway hypothesis, which is that use of one substance may lead to um, subsequent use of another substance, in particular, um, escalation of use to um, what might what one might consider more serious substance use behaviours, for example, from licit to illicit uh, drugs. So I'm going to structure the talk into two halves. The first half being uh, an explanation of the methodology and how we use genetically informed methods to support stronger causal inference in the context of observational epidemiology, starting with why we need to do that and then how we do do that. And then in the second half, I'll talk about the specific results that we found when we looked at these potential pathways from tobacco and alcohol use uh, onto a range of other substance use outcomes. So, the starting point for this is that epidemiology has a um, checkered history when it comes to identifying causal pathways. Certainly, it's straightforward to identify associations between putative exposures and outcomes. But at heart, those are causal questions, even if the data that we use, the observational methods that we use don't necessarily support strong causal inference. So what we're interested in is whether X causes Y, but the mere fact that X is associated with Y, is correlated with Y, doesn't by itself give us strong grounds for concluding that X is in fact causal. And so there are a range of findings in the published literature, many of which have entered the, the public imagination that are probably artifactual. There are a couple of headlines here that just illustrate how 
um, extreme some of these conclusions can be if they're uh, if they're taken at base value. But actually, there are many other conclusions that um, are actually quite robust in terms of being replicable, but probably artifactual because if you run the same study multiple times with ever larger sample sizes, but you recapitulate the biases that are inherent in some of those studies, you're going to get the same answer, but it's not necessarily going to be the right answer in terms of that cause and effect relationship. So things like the J-shaped relationship between alcohol consumption and all-cause mortality, which suggests that um, taken at face value, low levels of alcohol consumption are actually protective. That's probably artifactual to do with um, a range of uh, biases that are introduced through um, the use of particular types of data, observational data in particular. And in fact, when you look at um, that relationship using more robust methods, I would argue that the converging evidence is that the relationship between alcohol use and um, all-cause mortality is in fact linear. You see similar J-shaped relationships for BMI and all-cause mortality, suggesting that being slightly overweight is, uh, is protective. And again, I would argue that that is artifactual. And in fact, the true causal relationship is linear. So that's slightly disappointing because it would be quite good news if we could um, be slightly overweight and drink a moderate amount and that could be good for us. But in fact, the reality is probably um, more predictably that being overweight and drinking alcohol is not in fact good for us. And the problems um, are well described, but just to um, reiterate them, when we're dealing with observational associations, we know that there are confounders operating. So various factors that may influence both the likelihood of smoking and the likelihood of um, other substance use, diet, physical exercise, income, um, consumption of other substances, all of these things are likely to be different in smokers compared to non-smokers, for example. And whilst we can adjust for those things statistically, A, we never know whether we've actually measured all potential confounders that could be operating, and B, even if we have, we probably haven't measured them perfectly. So some residual confounding may be operating simply by virtue of the fact that there will be measurement error in anything that we choose to measure. And another form of confounding is reverse causality, where the outcome may actually be influencing the, um, the exposure. We see this with um, a number of health behaviors. For example, people who smoke will develop um, health outcomes that in turn may lead them to stop smoking because they get a diagnosis of um, uh, cardiovascular disease or lung cancer or whatever it might be. And if we're not careful and take that into account, that reverse causality could again bias the results that we get. So these problems are well described in observational epidemiology, but addressing them is not straightforward because as I say, even if we were to measure all potential confounders, because we can't measure them perfectly, because there will always be measurement error, there is always scope for residual confounding. So we need other approaches to causal inference that we can bring to bear beyond simply running ever larger conventional observational epidemiological studies. And this is where Mendelian randomization comes in. And the first point I'll make is that Mendelian randomization uses genetic information, but it's not fundamentally about genetics. It's using genetic variants as a proxy for an exposure of interest, effectively treating genotype as an instrumental variable, because on a population level um, approximation of Mendel's first and second laws, genotype should effectively be assigned at random at meiosis which means that if you inherit an allele, a version of a gene that predisposes you to smoke or to smoke more heavily or to drink rather than not drink alcohol, then you can use that genotype as a proxy for the, um, for the actual exposure in a way that effectively overlays a randomization structure onto your observational data because of those uh, principles of Mendel's first and second laws so that you're effectively creating something that is akin to, although not exactly like, a randomized control trial in your randomized data, in your um, observational data, by not using the directly measured exposure of interest, but by using this proxy that is effectively assigned at random at meiosis. So if you have a genetic variant that increases heaviness of smoking, for example, um, and such a variant exists, as I'll come on to talk about in a moment, then you can look at the different genotypes that people will fall into. If you're talking about a single nucleotide polymorphism, that creates three possible genotypes that uh, everyone will be one of. Um, and in this particular case, carrying one of the A alleles increases 
heaviness of smoking on average in a population by about one cigarette per day. So if you have two of those alleles, you smoke on average two cigarettes per day more than people who carry two copies of the G allele. And that doesn't mean that you can predict how much some any one individual smokes from their genotype, but it means at a population level, you know that people who are um, AA genotype will smoke more heavily on average than people who are AG genotype, who in turn will smoke more heavily on average than people who are GG genotype. And you can use genotype as a proxy for heaviness of smoking rather than directly measured um, heaviness of smoking. And when you use that approach to look in effectively positive control outcomes where you know what the answer is, then you get the answer that you would expect. So on the left-hand side, we have all-cause mortality as the outcome, and we have genotype, this single nucleotide polymorphism that predicts heaviness of smoking as the exposure, as a proxy for actual heaviness of smoking. And the advantage of this approach is that you can stratify your analysis into those who have ever smoked, and those who have never smoked. And if this genetic variant is operating only via heaviness of smoking, you would expect to only see effective genotype as a proxy for heaviness of smoking amongst those who have ever smoked and not amongst those who have never smoked. So that approach where you stratify on smoking status provides you with effectively a control condition that allows you to test whether or not the genotype as proxy is in fact operating via heaviness of smoking. So if you look at never smokers on the bottom left-hand uh, panel, you can see that there's no association between genotype and all-cause mortality. The point estimates fall along the null. Whereas if you look at that genotype um, that is proxying the heaviness of smoking and all-cause mortality amongst ever smokers, you can see a dose-response relationship with all-cause mortality with each additional risk allele, which again, on average, increases heaviness of smoking by one cigarette per day, increasing uh, the risk of all-cause mortality. So that confirms that smoking kills, which we knew, of course, but this is the point. It's a proof of principle analysis, but also shows that these genotypes that are proxying for heaviness of smoking are operating via smoking rather than via some other pleiotropic pathway where there could be other um, effects of these genetic variants that have, are having an effect more directly, or at least not via smoking. On all cause mortality. And we can rule that out because when we look amongst never smokers, we don't see any association. And similarly, if you look on the right hand side, this is uh, using the same genotype as a proxy for heaviness of smoking and looking at offspring birth weight amongst mothers who either did smoke in pregnancy, which is the top half of the right hand panel, or those who didn't smoke in pregnancy. And this is a per allele effect that's being shown here in this meta analysis across multiple studies. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that there is no uh, evidence of association of that genotype, which again is, is proxying for heaviness of smoking and offspring birth weight. Whereas amongst uh, pregnancies where the mothers did smoke, we can see an association between that allele and reduced offspring birth weight. Again, confirming what we already knew, which is that uh, smoking during pregnancy reduces offspring birth weight, which obviously has deleterious effects for the offspring. So these are proof of principle analyses that show that using these genetic proxies for heaviness of smoking gives us the results that we would expect. And the advantages of doing this are that you are effectively removing the problem of confounding because you are using proxies that are randomly assigned at conception. And because germline DNA sequence can't be altered once it's laid down, you remove the possibility of reverse uh, causality. So those two major challenges that exist within observational epidemiology are in principle addressed by using these genetic proxies for the exposure. Now, of course, that's under a certain number of assumptions. One of those assumptions is that the genetic proxy is only operating via the exposure of interest. In this case, that this genetic variant that influences heaviness of smoking is not having other effects on other pathways that could also influence your outcomes. But in this particular case, we can test that, as I've said, by looking at never smokers, or in the case of offspring birth weight, uh, non-smoking pregnancies to confirm that the genetic variant is not having an effect independently of smoking status, which provides us with, with further confidence that the results that we are seeing are due to smoking. So effectively, what this is doing is telling us about the effects of smoking, but using genetic information as a proxy to protect against confounding and reverse causality.
And actually, although this isn't the main focus of the talk, that then gives us a lens through which to interpret um, the results of genome-wide association studies of any phenotype. Because if this logic holds that these genetic variants can be proxies for modifiable exposures like smoking, then we should see the results of GWAS as in part telling us about modifiable exposures, in principle at least. So on the right-hand side are the results of the genome-wide association studies that tell us that this genetic variant that I've been talking about associates with cigarettes per day. So you can see that this, um, what's called a Manhattan plot of all of the uh, genetic variants genotyped in a single genome-wide association study, um, you can see the association of all of those different genetic variants with uh, cigarettes per day. The log p-value is on the y-axis and you have the different chromosomal regions on the x-axis. And you can see this spike on chromosome 15, which is where this genetic variant um, is found. And it's within a cluster of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor genes. So there's a biological plausibility to this influencing heaviness of smoking. But when we do a genome-wide association study of lung cancer, we also see a spike on chromosome 15, not because that genetic variant is directly influencing lung cancer risk, but because smoking causes lung cancer. And that modifiable cause of lung cancer is being picked up in that genome-wide association study of lung cancer. You see exactly the same for COPD and emphysema. When you do a genome-wide association study of COPD and emphysema, you see a signal on chromosome 15 because smoking causes COPD and emphysema. You see the same for peripheral arterial disease. So these genetic studies of these different disease phenotypes are all picking up this signal on chromosome 15 because what is being picked up is in fact a smoking variant that increases heaviness of smoking and therefore increases the risk of all of these diseases for which smoking is known to be a causal risk factor. So this paper in the top left might be of interest if, you, if you'd like to know a bit more about that logic. It, it's about how we can use this framework to interpret the results of genetic studies to tell us about modifiable environmental exposures like smoking and anything else that could be picked up in the same way. So I'll pause there because um, I realize that that methodology is um, potentially new to some people who might be on this call and there might be some questions. Thank you so much. I think what we'll do is we'll first turn this over to our discussant, uh, Justin White, and please audience members place your questions and comments in the Q&A feature. Thank you. Um, I, a couple questions for you. Uh, so I, I'm not very familiar with this method as my questions will show. Uh, I, I wanted to ask what, about um, a couple of things that a couple of what I understand to be common pitfalls with Mendelian randomization, one of which you, you sort of already alluded to, just so the audience and I can get a sense of how this typically gets handled. So the first is, I think it's called linkage disequilib disequilibrium, which I think is actually what, something you talked about, but in the broader instrumental variables literature might be referred to as a violation of the exclusion restriction. In other words, that sort of the effect is operating all through smoking. So my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that linkage disequilibrium is where some alleles or SNPs are gonna, often ones that are nearby are gonna be inherited together. Um, and so I guess the question is, how do we know that the nearby SNPs aren't causing some of the effect that we might see in the study rather than it operating through smoking? Um, and so, you know, for example, if it's some, so, something having to do with like some shared risk factor or something that, that could be driving the effect as opposed to smoking itself. Um, so sort of like what, what's the evidence that this effect might, you, you talked about this stratified analysis, but I'm wondering if there are other ways to sort of get, rule out that, that that is a concern. No, that's a really good point. So the, the, the basic concern is that the, the variants that we're using as a proxy for, let's say, heaviness of smoking, are actually having other effects. And that could be because the variant itself is having an effect on another biological pathway, neural pathway, or it could be that there's a different variant nearby that's having other effects. So that second part would be linkage disequilibrium. That first part would be, um, would be pleiotropy, where the genetic variant is in fact the genetic variant, but it's having other effects on other pathways. They both amount to the same problem, which is that the proxy that we're using for heaviness of smoking is also doing something else um, via one of those two different mechanisms. And that is a concern. So in the case of 
heaviness of smoking, we have the ability to stratify on smoking status to test whether or not it's operating via smoking. And that's a really nice way of doing it. We also know a lot about the um, genetic variant that we use. We know that it's causal and we know that it's, uh, we, we know how it exerts its effect on um, heaviness of smoking. There have been some really nice preclinical studies showing that it, uh, that, um, that gene regulates our ability to tolerate the aversive effect of nicotine. So if, if we have the version of the gene that is associated with heavier smoking, that's because we're less sensitive to the aversive toxic effects of high doses of nicotine. So we know a lot about the biology and that gives us confidence that what we're using as a proxy is in fact doing what we want it to. Um, it's relatively rare that we have that luxury of knowing all of that biology and being able to stratify on something that allows us to test that assumption. And that's going to be particularly relevant when I talk about smoking initiation in the subsequent part of the talk, because when you're dealing with smoking initiation, one of the advantages is that you don't have to stratify. So you don't re reduce your statistical power by only looking in, you know, a third of your sample or whatever it is. But you then increase the risk that these pleiotropic pathways are actually operating. And we do have evidence that in fact, the genetic variants associated with smoking initiation might not be directly influencing only smoking initiation. And I'll talk in the second half about some of the methods that we can use to address that. But in short, we need to include things like negative controls to see whether or not the exposure is having effects on other outcomes that aren't plausibly going to be um, operating via smoking, because that would then give us reason to be a bit more cautious in our interpretation. So really, there's, you know, I don't want to pretend that this is a sort of silver bullet methodology that will always give you the right answer. I've given the best case scenario um, so far, just to demonstrate the principle, but in the more complex exposures um, or where we're not able to stratify, then there are other approaches that we need to take and we need to be a little bit more cautious. Great. So you, you mentioned this issue of pleiotropic effects where you know the same uh, genetic variant can have multiple effects. I, I know that in gene, genome-wide association studies that sometimes the, the same allele can be identified as having uh, being associated with, with multiple risk factors. In, in this study or in general, is it the case that like when you find a SNP that does have that, it, uh, uh, multiple associations with uh, other sort of risk factors, does that get discarded or where you only focus on the ones that would be predictors of smoking association uh, initiation or, or um, do you include all the ones that sort of have predictive power for smoking initiation? Well, as you'll see in the second half, the problem is that, um, you know, we run a genome wide association study for smoking initiation and we look at smokers versus you know, the ever smokers versus never smokers. And we test a million genetic variants. And we can find a signal, but what those genetic variants are doing and whether they are operating proximally on smoking initiation through, for example, sensitivity to the effects of nicotine, or they're operating distally on smoking initiation, for example, because they actually are related to our propensity for taking risks or trying new things. They're both going to associate with smoking, but via very different mechanistic pathways and some of those will not be problematic for Mendelian randomization, but other ones will be problematic. So if the genetic variants are operating proximally by regulating our um, sensitivity to nicotine, that's fine because they're probably not doing much else. But if they're operating by a risk-taking personality, for example, that is a problem because then it's not really about smoking, it's about risk-taking. And the challenge is we don't always know what those different genetic variants are doing. So it's not straightforward to be able to say, well, we'll use these SNPs because we know exactly what they're doing and we won't use these SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms because we know what they're doing in a different direction. So the, the strength of genome-wide association studies is that they are kind of agnostic as to mechanism. They're just statistical. They show us that there are these genetic associations. But if you don't know what those genetic variants are doing, it can be difficult to, to do what you're describing, to separate them out into those that are clean, if you like, for, for the exposure of interest and those that aren't. Okay. Well, one more quick question, if I may. Uh, how much variation in smoking tends to be explained by this, um, the, the, uh, these SNPs that, you've, that get identified in the GWASs? And uh, in other words, like what's the, the strength of that first stage? So, I mean, that, that varies. We know that a good proportion of the variability in um, 
smoking behavior can be accounted for by genetic factors. Um, we've known that for a long time through, through twin and family studies. The, the proportion of that that is accounted for by um, variants identified through um, genome-wide association studies is somewhat less, but is increasing all the time. The larger the um, genome-wide association study, the more SNPs you identify, the more the variants that uh, can be accounted for. Um, I think we're of the, or it depends a bit on the phenotype, but between 15 to 20% of the variants can be accounted for by identified, um, identified SNPs. Um, and actually, in the case of um, that single variant that influences heaviness of smoking, that single variant alone accounts for 1% of the variants in heaviness of smoking, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a common genetic variant, that's actually enormous. So what that means is that you do need quite large sample sizes for Mendelian randomization to be robust, um, but that's becoming more tractable all the time, A, because there are large cohort studies available, and B, because with these ever larger genome-wide association studies, we are identifying more and more SNPs that can be used as a proxy. The, the challenge is that as we identify more and more SNPs, we're going down the kind of long tail of very different mechanistic pathways being picked up um, by those SNPs. So the challenges that we've been talking about increase rather than decrease. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Justin, and thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. I think there's some interest uh, as to whether there may be um, this, you're going to be looking at vaping uh, or flaping, uh, flavors in, in the study later. And then there's a second question that there's just a clarification about the classifying um, pro, uh, alleles and genotypes. If you are never, if you're a never smoker, how do you assign someone a G allele and how to tell if someone has one or two Gs. If maybe if you're going to get into that, that's great. Um, or just offer that clarification. Thank you. So um, you will you will carry these genotypes irrespective of whether or not you're a smoker. Um, so uh, everyone has the same genes, uh, or rather has a copy of this gene that can exist in different forms. Um, and you will be one of GG, GA, or AA, whether or not you smoke. If you are a smoker then on average, that genotype will influence how heavily you smoke. Um, but part of the strength of this uh, Mendelian randomization approach is that those genetic proxies are available for everybody on whom we have uh, DNA that has been genotyped. So this is something that, that can be directly measured uh, and provides us with that proxy irrespective of, of smoking status. And in the context of that variant that influences heaviness of smoking, we can vet, we can stratify on smoking status and still look at those different genotypes because they exist for everybody and by stratifying test whether or not that genotype is influencing the outcome via smoking or not because if it is then you should only see the association amongst those who do in fact smoke um, in terms of the point about vaping i will touch on that later it's not something that we looked at directly in this paper um, but when i come to talk about some of the challenges of the approach that we took some work that we've done around e-cigarette use um, is relevant to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, please continue with the presentation. Thank you. So I'm gonna move on to a slightly different exposure now, um, which is smoking initiation. So previously I was talking about heaviness of smoking and I was talking about a single genetic variant. Now I'll be talking about smoking initiation and also alcohol use, but I'm gonna focus, um, given the nature of this, uh, this seminar series on, on, the, um, on the smoking outcomes. And um, here we can't stratify on smoking status because the exposure is ever versus never smoking. So the thing that we would stratify on if we were looking at heaviness of smoking is the exposure of interest here. So by definition, we can't stratify on it. And rather than looking at a single genetic variant, we're looking at a polygenic risk score that includes all of the genetic variants that have been identified um, as associated with smoking initiation. And one of the challenges, as I mentioned earlier, that that brings is that we don't know what all of those different genetic variants are doing in terms of the mechanistic pathway from that genetic variation to that phenotypic variation of smoking initiation. Some of that might be, as I was saying earlier, quite proximal, influencing how we respond to nicotine when we're first exposed to it. Some might be more distal, influencing our propensity for trying new things or trying things that we shouldn't be trying when we're 13, whatever it might be. And we don't yet have 
um, a good understanding of all of those different pathways for all of those different genetic variants that we use in this polygenic risk score that is our proxy for smoking initiation. But the basic um, causal pathways that we are looking at here, the causal model that we're testing is this one, where we're using the genetic instrument for um, smoking initiation as a proxy for smoking initiation itself. And as you can see from this causal graph, um, the, the, there is no pathway from illicit substance use back to genetic instrument because DNA uh, sequence is, is laid down at conception and can't be changed by environmental factors. And there's no pathway from potential confounders back to the genetic instrument because of this um, approximation of Mendel's first and second laws at a population level. So that's what we're testing here. The question is, is smoking initiation causally influencing illicit substance use outcomes? And the proxy that we're using is um, genetic variants associated with smoking initiation. So I'll talk about the results, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges in the interpretation of that, uh, those results. There were a number of data sets that, um, that were used for this. Uh, in the introduction, there was mention made of my interest in open science. And um, one of the advantages of this methodology is that it leverages publicly available data sets, or largely publicly available data sets, Genome-wide association studies tend to publish their summary statistics on, um, on databases and various servers that allow others to access them. And we can use those summary statistics in these analyses. So the exposure outcomes um, of smoking initiation and drinks per week were from this Lewisal uh, meta-analysis genome-wide association study that were, was published in 2019. And then we looked as our outcomes at cannabis use, cannabis dependence, cocaine dependence and opioid dependence. So when we looked at smoking initiation, we saw evidence of an effect of smoking initiation on alcohol consumption. So what you can see here is the exposure on the left-hand side, followed by the outcome, uh, the number of single nucleotide polymorphisms that were available uh, to analyze, um, the point estimate and confidence interval, and then the p-value. And we found evidence that um, smoking initiation was causally influencing drinks per week, cannabis use, and potentially, although the evidence was weaker, cannabis dependence. I should say that um, for cocaine dependence and opioid dependence, we did have relatively low statistical power because these were um, smaller genome-wide association studies than the ones that were available for smoking initiation, drinks per week, cannabis use in particular. So to some extent, um, the results are shaped by the statistical power available to us. And you can see that in the confidence intervals um, shown on the, uh, the right-hand side graphically, that for some of those outcomes like cocaine dependence and opioid dependence, we had quite wide confidence intervals uh, indicating the relatively um, low power of those analyses. But these results would indicate that smoking initiation is having a causal effect on alcohol consumption and cannabis use, and potentially downstream of that, cannabis dependence. We didn't find much evidence of a causal pathway in the other direction. So you're able to flip this around and use genetic variants associated with drinks per week to see whether or not they influence smoking initiation. Um, this to some extent was a negative control analysis because as, um, as many of you will know, of course, people tend to start smoking as one of the first substances that they use. That's not universally true, but it's largely true at a population level that people tend to start smoking when they're relatively young, um, maybe start drinking around the same time, but certainly things like co cocaine use and uh, opioid use would typically happen somewhat later. Um, so the temporal relationship between these different substance use behaviors is such that we would expect if there is a causal pathway for it to be from smoking initiation to the other behaviors rather than the other way around. And these analyses, which use the Mendelian randomization approach that I've been describing, <clears throat> largely confirmed that, that uh, there was not really any clear evidence of a causal pathway from one substance to another. There was some weak evidence for a pathway from cannabis use to smoking initiation. Um, one of the challenges with looking at cannabis, of course, is that um, most, in some countries at least, uh, cannabis is used with tobacco. Uh, so it's very difficult to tease apart cannabis use and uh, tobacco use. We did look at alcohol consumption. So for completeness, I'll show that here. We didn't see much evidence that alcohol 
was acting as a, uh, let's call it gateway drug in this context. We didn't find much evidence for a causal pathway from drinks per week as our measure of alcohol consumption on cannabis use, can, uh, cannabis dependence, cocaine dependence, or opioid dependence. You can see that um, uh, the p-value certainly didn't provide any clear statistical evidence for that. Uh, the statistical power of these analyses was somewhat lower again, uh, and you can again see that in the relatively wide confidence intervals, um, but we didn't find any evidence to suggest that alcohol consumption was having a causal effect on these outcomes. And then finally, again, in the other direction, um, we did find some evidence for opioid dependence having an effect on uh, drinks per week, um, <clears throat> which is interesting. But again, this is not alcohol initiation, it's heaviness of, of consumption. One of the limitations of um, Mendelian randomization is that you are restricted to that for which there is a genome-wide association study um, where genetic variants have been identified. So that, that limits what questions you can answer using this methodology. But generally speaking, we didn't find much evidence for um, reverse causality in terms of these substance use behaviors having an impact on drinks per week, um, with the exception of opioid dependence um, serving to increase alcohol consumption, which is perhaps not surprising. So in terms of those results, the headline message would be that smoking initiation appears to have a causal effect on alcohol use and cannabis use and potentially cannabis dependence, which may just be a downstream effect of having an effect on cannabis use, but not on other substance use phenotypes. And we don't see any evidence for reverse causality. And largely there were no causal pathways identified for alcohol use, either with alcohol use as the exposure or with alcohol use as the outcome, with the exception of a potential pathway from opioid dependence to alcohol consumption. However, for some of these analyses, we had low statistical power, and you could see that in the wide confidence interval. And for some of these phenotypes, we had to, when we were using them as an exposure, use a lower p-value threshold for selecting the genetic variants to use in our polygenic risk score. Ordinarily, we would use genetic variants that have been identified with genome-wide significant, so a p-value of 10 to the minus 8, that's quite a stringent uh, p-value threshold. But for some of these phenotypes, there weren't any uh, genetic variants that identified with that level of statistical significance, so we had to use a, a more relaxed threshold in order to be able to create a genetic risk score to use as a proxy. And that increases the risk that we might be picking up genetic variants that are having these pleiotropic effects. And we did find evidence of pleiotropy. Um, <clears throat> I didn't show the, uh, the analyses here, but um, there are various tests that one can use, uh, in modifications of the standard Mendelian randomization uh, analysis that give you some sense of whether or not there are these pleiotropic pathways operating. And we did find some evidence of that, which leads to this uh, question of what these smoking initiation SNPs are actually capturing. And I talked about that earlier, that there could be proximal versus distal effects. So I'll just finish by talking about um, what we think might be happening there in terms of what these genetic influences on smoking initiation actually are. And this touches on um, the point about, uh, or the, the question about whether or not this relates to vaping. I mentioned earlier negative controls. So negative controls uh, in the context of outcomes are outcomes where there is no plausible bio, uh, biological pathway or causal pathway from the exposure of interest. One of my favorite examples is this one um, by one of my colleagues in Bristol who actually developed the Mendelian randomization method. But this is a, a conventional epidemiological study. There is a strong association between smoking and suicide, but the question is whether it's causal. It's plausible to come up with a pathway that could be operating from smoking to suicide. But here, George and his colleagues used homicide as a negative control. In other words, the risk of being murdered. And it's much more difficult to come up with a plausible causal pathway from smoking to your risk of being murdered. In other words, it's unlikely that smoking is going to genuinely be a causal risk factor for being murdered. But in fact, the strength of association between smoking and homicide was just as great as the association between smoking and suicide and robust to statistical adjustment for uh, potential confounders. And the quote that they used um, is, unless the provisional wing of the health education lobby has moved on to a direct action phase during which they shoot smokers, 
this association is very unlikely to be causal. And the point here is that we need to be really testing what we think are causal pathways by using negative controls. And we can incorporate that approach in these genetically informed studies by using a range of outcomes that could not plausibly be um, downstream of smoking. So we looked at these same genetic variants associated with smoking initiation in the context of e-cigarette use. This was not e-cigarette initiation. These were young adults who had already been smokers when um, e-cigarettes emerged on the market in the UK. So in the majority of cases, it was um, people who had transitioned from smoking to vaping. Um, and we found that these genetic variants associated with smoking associated just as strongly with risk of vaping, uh, a, a, using a range of different p-value thresholds for determining what should be included in our polygenic risk score. Um, we found very clear evidence for an association between these smoking initiation SNPs and vaping. But more importantly, we found evidence of an association between these smoking initiation SNPs and a range of other phenotypes that are not directly to do with smoking. Number of sexual partners, being in trouble with the law, enjoying taking risks. So these genetic variants are associated with these other behaviors. You could potentially come up with causal pathways from smoking to these different phenotypes. But to me, a more parsimonious explanation is that what these genetic variants are actually capturing is risk-taking propensity. And that is reflected in people's likelihood of smoking, potentially people's likelihood of vaping, but also people's uh, likelihood to engage in a number of risky behaviors like number of sexual partners, like being in trouble with the law and so on. But the best negative control that we were able to use was a range of behavioral phenotypes measured at age seven. Almost no one has smoked a cigarette by age seven. So these genetic variants associated with smoking initiation are obviously there from birth. And we can use them to look at the association of those genetic variants that have been identified as associated with smoking initiation and look at whether they're associated with these different phenotypes at age seven when no one has had any exposure to smoking. So these, these phenotypes can't be downstream of smoking. They can't be caused by smoking, but they could be caused directly or relatively directly, at least not via smoking, by these genetic variants. And we find evidence, particularly of an association with conduct disorder, also to some extent with hyperactivity at age seven, suggesting again that what these genetic variants that we've identified as identical or have been identified as associated with smoking initiation are actually capturing propensity to risk taking. So when we use these negative controls, we find that these genetic variants are probably having these pleiotropic effects that we were talking about earlier, which doesn't mean that the results that I reported earlier are not correct in terms of the effect of smoking on those different outcomes. It just means that we need to be much more careful in that interpretation. It may be true that smoking is having a causal effect. It may be that risk-taking is actually a genetic compound in this case that is affecting all of those outcomes, or it may be some combination of both. So we're going to need to do more work to determine what, if any, of that apparent effect of smoking on, for example, cannabis use that we identified is in fact due to smoking, as opposed to this broad underlying risk-taking phenotype. So I'll just conclude by saying that the method is increasingly popular within epidemiology as a tool for allowing for stronger causal inference. At face value, I'll suggest, our results suggest that smoking may play a causal role in cannabis use and potentially dependence. But the evidence that we have from other analyses indicates that there could be pleiotropic effects of those genetic variants we're using as proxies for smoking initiation. So we need to take a much more considered approach, triangulate evidence from multiple methods and multiple sources before we arrive at a firm conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Uh, I think we'll give our discussant a moment to ask some questions. And just a reminder to audience members, if you have questions and comments, please place them in the Q&A. Thank you. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, would you be able to go back to the main results slide that shows um, smoking initiation as the exposure, just to ask a couple of clarifying questions? Sure. Um, 
So one is just uh, here are the the number of SNPs, which I understand to be the the SNPs that predict smoking vary from uh, across the the different outcomes. And I'm I'm wondering if you can just sort of explain is that because uh, those are the ones that reach your p-value threshold across these different data sets, or um, because they're not available in certain data sets, sort of what drives that variation? It's um, it's that they're not available in the outcome. So you need to have the SNPs available in both the exposure data set and the outcome data set. And different genome-wide association studies will use different genotyping platforms and the extent to which you can impute certain SNPs from other information um, varies. So the, the, the extent to which you have the same SNPs in both data sets, to some extent, drives the statistical power that you have. And that's that's what's uh, driving that variability that you have here. Okay, great. And uh, just to, in in terms of trying to interpret the effect size for the, the estimates on, on this slide, it, it seems to me and uh, uh, that the you know the relationship between smoking initiation and drinks per week is quite small. Maybe if this is I, I'm interpreting this as 0.03, you know, 0.06 uh, drinks per week, which seems yeah. quite small. Whereas I would you know, the, the odds ratios for the relationship with cannabis are, are a bit larger. Um, it, uh, it, I, I guess, would you say anything else about sort of the, how large the, these effects are in terms of the, um, you know, how much smoke initiation is um, driving these other behaviors? Yeah, I, I think you're right that the, the larger effects are the ones that we see for, um, for cannabis use and cannabis dependence and the effects for drinks per week, whilst statistically detectable, if you like, uh, are not, particularly large, um, but you have to be a little bit careful about directly interpreting these effect estimates um, because you're using these genetic proxies. So you need to, there needs to be a degree of conversion, if you like, to what it would be if it was actually um, the measured behavior, the measured exposure, as opposed to a genetic proxy for it. That's less of a concern for a categorical exposure like smoking initiation, but when you're dealing with um, the slip that I talked about previously that captures heaviness of smoking, you need to be really careful because although on average, each SNP is associated with smoking one cigarette per day more, in fact, cigarettes per day is quite a noisy measure of actual exposure because people can smoke their cigarettes very differently and their true level of exposure can vary considerably. So you just need to be a little bit careful about directly interpreting the effect estimates. But in terms of that kind of qualitative um, assessment, I think you're right. And I, I think one thing that I didn't hear highlighted is that the data come from European ancestry individuals. And I, I actually don't know whether the, they are just located in certain countries or not, but it seems like the, these results apply specifically to, to that group. And, uh, I, you know, to the extent that gateway effects, I, I guess, vary across racial groups or uh, other groups that 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 would not be picked up here. I, I'm curious if you have anything else to say about that point. Yeah, that's a really good point. So first of all, you're right that the majority of genome-wide association studies, but mostly for technical reasons, have been conducted in samples of European ancestry. So typically from sample uh, cohort studies in European countries and in North America. Um, and that's a limitation. Uh, it's a limitation in terms of generalizability. It's also a limitation because, as you sort of alluded to, there may be genuinely different causal effects in different countries. Um, and there is actually evidence for that. So when we look at um, body mass index and education using a similar Mendelian randomization framework, using genetic uh, variants for education, which again, we don't know what they're doing, but you can use them in this framework. Uh, and surprisingly, you get, you get the results that you would expect more often than not. For example, you find that education has an impact on smoking. When that's looked at, education on BMI, you find that in high income countries, genetic variants associated with educational attainment predict lower BMI. In other words, more educated people um, have lower BMI, which is what, what, we, what we see observationally, and that is likely to be causal. Whereas in uh, lower income countries, you see the opposite association. And that again is probably a real causal pathway in the opposite direction because the nature of the causal relationships between educational attainment and BMI could be genuinely different in different contexts. So going back to your point, it's possible that the causal pathways operating in the context of gateway effects 
could genuinely be different in different subpopulations. And if we don't have the tools to be able to interrogate those pathways in those different populations, we, we shouldn't necessarily assume that the results that I showed here would generalize to those other populations. Okay. Um, so I, I see that there aren't other questions pending, so I'm just going to keep clowning ahead. Um, so you, in your earlier response, you uh, mentioned that the SNPs may not be available in both data sets that you're using in terms of the genetic variance to the exposure and genetic variance to outcome. How much do we have to worry about the comparability of the individuals in those two data sets? Like, is there work uh, in this particular study or in general that sort of shows that those individuals are, are comparable, which means that we can sort of apply our estimates from, um, you know, one to the other? I think we can be reasonably confident that they're somewhat comparable for the same reasons that we talked about before, which is that these genetic studies typically recruit from relatively um, homogenous samples of people of European ancestry and so on. I think it does become more of a problem when you're dealing with um, illicit substance use outcomes like cocaine dependence and opioid dependence, because you're dealing obviously then with a, a much more selected subsample of the, uh, of the wider population. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think that's a, a major concern. Um, okay. And uh, just to sh shift topic, so I, we are very interested in sort of tobacco related policy here. And I'm curious about your thoughts on what the policy implications are. You sort of qualified your these results that, you know, you find some evidence for gateway effects, but um, uh, in, that we need to take a more nuanced approach. Do you, do you draw any policy implications from this in terms of what we should be doing? Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> at one level, the policy implications around smoking are always the same, which is we should get people to stop smoking. Um, you know, the world would be a better place if no one smoked. That, that, that's uncontroversial. The, the way in which we've been using these um, results, and, and this is where our relationship with Action on Smoking and Health comes in, because they're obviously an advocacy organisation, is that um, for some policymakers, governments, smoking tobacco control is not a particularly kind of exciting topic for them, um, whereas driving down rates of um, cannabis use, cocaine use, opioid use, for example, is a major policy um, consideration for them. So if we can say, look, by focusing on tobacco control, you might have positive downstream effects on the prevalence of cannabis use. And although we don't find evidence for it, in principle, we might have done cocaine use and, and opioid use. That makes tobacco control more interesting to policymakers who might otherwise not be interested. The same is true for the work we've done on mental health, showing that um, smoking in some contexts appears to have a causal effect on mental health outcomes, means that if improving mental health is an area of, of policy activity, we can go in and say, actually tobacco control needs to be part of a comprehensive mental health strategy. So it's about um, bringing tobacco control back to um, the forefront of policymakers' minds in the context of other considerations that they, they might be uh, thinking about. Um, so one, one final question that I have is uh, a, a general one. So th this method, I think, could be interested in, you know, useful to a lot of the, the other our audience members. And so many of them don't have a genetics background. I'm wondering what your advice would be. You know, there, there it seems like there's a daunting set of uh, new terminology as well as sort of technical expertise required. Is this something that you think non-geneticists can sort of do on their own or, or do you really need to have somebody on your team who has a, you know, that sort of um, training? You don't need a geneticist really. Um, again, this is not about genetics. It's using genetic information as a proxy. You do need someone with good quantitative skills because there are a range of sensitivity analyses that um, are more or less sensitive to the assumptions around things like pleiotropy um, that one would use in a standard Mendelian randomization analysis. The basic analysis is just a, a linear regression, it's not complicated, where your exposure is this polygenic risk score. So the basic approach is straightforward, but to do it well requires you to use a number of other different sensitivity analyses that require slightly stronger quantitative skills. Um, I think the starting point for anyone that's interested would be one of the many very good review articles that are out there at the moment. Um, and also perhaps that G equals E um, article that I mentioned that just explains how this is not about genetics, it's about modifiable exposures that we can 
captured to some extent with genetic information. So it helps just kind of get your head around what's actually happening here. And in fact, if I stop sharing my screen, there's um, partly for this reason that this is a, a method that people are interested in, but feels very different because it's, um, uh, it's using genetic information. We created a um, primer that uh, is a short animation that uh, is meant to um, explain the methodology to people. So I've put that uh, into the chat. I'm not sure if everyone who's attending can see that, but maybe it could be passed on to, um, to those who can't see it in the chat. Um, but that's I'll, just a I'll copy it and send it to everyone, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, um, and of course, if anyone's interested in, in um, getting hold of any of those articles that I mentioned, people are welcome to email me. And um, one of the advantages of an unusual surname is that I'm easy to, easy to Google. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justin. And thank you for these wonderful answers and this really fascinating uh, presentation. We have a few comments uh, from our audience and then one from one of our, um, one of the top organizers. Um, First, Amanda Holm asks, can you comment on how early exposure to secondhand smoke may factor into uh, these causal relationships? So um, that's, that's a really good question. And actually, um, uh, one of the things that we are now doing as an extension of this approach, there are some uh, cohorts now that have data on offspring, but also the parents and genetic data on offspring and the parents. And one of the things that that allows you to do, and I, I, I won't go into the technical details, but it allows you to tease apart which genetic variants the offspring has that they inherited from their parents and which genetic variants the parents had that they didn't pass on to their offspring. And that allows you to test whether the intergenerational transmission of, let's say, smoking is operating via genetic inheritance. In other words, if a parent has a genetic propensity to smoke, and a child has a genetic propensity to smoke, they're more likely to smoke, or via something about the parenting environment, which could be the in utero environment, or it could be growing up in a house with parents who smoke. But it does allow you to tease apart that direct genetic inheritance and that indirect pathway, which isn't quite the same. It doesn't, uh, the indirect pathway doesn't allow you to localize that within the in utero environment, but it, it gives you some sense of whether that wider parenting environment might be part of what's happening here. Um, so that's one approach that we're taking to try and uh, look at that intergenerational transmission question. And of course, there are other um, methods that you can use to look at um, smoking during pregnancy. One of the negative control methods that's been used is to look at the association of paternal smoking during pregnancy. And that's been quite effective at showing when smoking is or is not causal when it comes to smoking in pregnancy. Because if you see equally strong effects of the father smoking during pregnancy, then it's unlikely to be due to the intrauterine environment. It's due to probably something else. Great, thank you. I think this uh, that answer addressed Lisa Sloan's question, but Lisa, please re-ask your question if that's not the case. We have a question from Ken Warner, and I'll, I'll just read that. Um, uh, you started by controlling for genotype, noting that the AAs who were ever smokers had an elevated mortality rate than those who did not smoke. Hence, smoking causes mortality. You said that genotype can influence propensity smoke or the frequency. In theory, couldn't risk-taking propensity as measured by seven-year-olds' behaviors be the genetic connection and risk-taking then associated with subsequent smoking rather than the genotype directly causing smoking and hence mortality? So um, the, the first results that I was showing were for a single genetic variant that... Um, specifically influence heaviness of smoking. And we know a lot about the biology of that genetic variant and its influence on heaviness of smoking. And because it's influencing heaviness of smoking, that allows us to stratify on smoking status. And because we only see that effect of genotype proxying for heaviness of smoking amongst those who've ever smoked, that suggests that effectively there's a dose response relationship between heaviness of smoking and all cause mortality. When it came to smoking initiation, we were talking about other genetic variants that in fact that genetic variant associated with heaviness of smoking doesn't show up in genome-wide association studies of smoking initiation which again suggests that it's not response to nicotine that is being captured by those genetic variants associated with smoking initiation it's something else which is where the risk-taking stuff comes in so so no I think we can still be quite confident about those results from heaviness of smoking 
on all-cause mortality, on offspring birth weight. And of course, we, we know those effects of smoking and on, um, on mortality and um, offspring birth weight. The risk-taking part comes in when we're specifically looking at smoking initiation. Great, thank you. Uh, just one question from one of the uh, panelists, Mike Pesco asks, economists often think of the strength of the first stage relationship in terms of F statistics. What is the F stat in uh, some of the tables that you presented uh, that are relevant of the genetic information on smoking initiation? That's a good question. I couldn't tell you um, off the top of my head. I mean, weak instrument bias is a concern in um, uh, Mendelian randomization uh, studies because you, what you're using as a proxy is capturing only a small proportion of the variance in your exposure. So the F statistic is something that's routinely reported. Unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, the specifics um, off the top of my head, but they are in the, uh, they are in the paper. Great, thank you. Uh, Deb Messina has a question. She, uh, they are interested in un understanding if anyone is studying grandparent, grandchild tobacco use where the grandchildren were actually raised in completely non-smoking households. Uh, that is no siblings, no parents who smoke. And just if you're aware of that type of research. I'm sure someone is. That's not something that, that we have looked at ourselves. I mean, that, that, that's, um, that question around the environment that one grows up in is obviously a really important one. And we are trying to get at that through these um, different pathways that I was talking about earlier, but not in that, in that specific context. We don't have access um, in the work that we do to um, samples that are of that nature. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you've done a wonderful job with the presentation and we have cleared out all the Q&A. So I'll let the MC take it from here. Thank you. Uh, moderate and discuss and finally thank you to the audience of 139 people for your participation have a top snotch weekend